Welcome folks, here let's go make your event here. After starting out her career in news, Melody Gilbert went on to shoot, direct, and edit her own documentary films. After the success of Married at the Mall and Hole, she continued with serious subject matter with her movie, A Life Without Pain. Please welcome back to Butter City, Melody Gilbert. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's good to have you back. Um, so you've had, you get two movies kind of under your belt. They do pretty well. You've done the festival thing. You're looking for new subject matter, A Life Without Pain. Let's talk quickly about just kind of what that movie's about and then how you found it. Uh, well, A Life Without Pain is about three children who literally can't feel pain. They have no ability to feel pain. And that was absolutely fascinating to me when I heard about it. I heard about there was one girl in Minnesota who had this condition, and there's only a couple dozen people who have it in the whole country. So um, Less than 100 in the world, right? I it's mean. a little more than 100 in the world now because since the phone came out, we found more people. And, you know, that never knew that there were other people who had the same problem. It's very interesting. There's actually a little pocket of people in Japan that we didn't know about before. But anyway, uh, so I started by contacting the Minnesota family and asking um, the mom. I got her on the phone, and I just said, hey, is there anybody that's done a documentary about you guys? And she said, no. I said, um, would you mind if I just come out and visit with you? Um, she said, when? How about tomorrow? And I uh, brought my camera with me, kept it in the car just in case. And sure enough, you know, about an hour after I got there, I just pulled out my camera and started shooting, and that's how it started. Really? Yeah. And then from there, we found later on uh, they had been contacted by a family in Norway and a family in Germany that had older kids that had this uh, condition. So I followed that family, the, the Minnesota family, for a year, but then the uh, other people I had to go find out what their lives were like too. So you, I mean, you got these people in front of a camera inside of a day. You built up that Pretty level of trust so. yeah. that quickly. Yeah. I mean, that must kind of be on account of your background in journalism, don't you? Maybe. I mean, I did, you know, I did do a lot of investigative work for a while when I was uh, in TV news, and I think I, it, you just kind of get over the fear of just walking into people's lives. I mean, if you're going to knock on someone's door and ask them a question, you kind of, you know, it doesn't, it's easy then to make a phone call and show up the next day and do something pleasant. You know, yeah. it wasn't like, I mean, I felt like this was um, an opportunity. I like to think of my filmmaking, uh, a lot of times people say, well, how, how do you get people to do that? How do you get people to be in your films? And I don't feel like I get anybody. I feel like I give them an opportunity to tell their story. So yeah. I approach it differently. Well, it certainly is a different, is, I mean, it continues on with serious subject matter. Hole was really told it, about a, a unique story about some unique people, I mean, who really have a... I guess a desire that most people would consider strange. They wanted yeah. to be amputees. Right. And here we kind of go, <laughs> yeah, amputees. amputees. <laughs> this is the symbol for amputee. Yeah. <laughs> and we go on to people who, who can't feel pain. I mean, right. another kind of a very small pocket of a population. Yeah. Um, so you, you seem to really have an eye kind of for kind of the, the human condition and, and the way, the different ways it expresses itself. Yeah. What do you think about kind of you in your own life that draws you to these stories? Oh, I don't know. I guess... Um, well, when I heard about the story about the, the kid who can't feel pain, the first thing that came up for me was, I wonder what it must be like to be that mother. And um, so that really drew me in. And then, of course, I started thinking, what would it be like to be that sister? Because uh -huh. she has an older sister. And, um, I, and of course, the father as well. I mean, but, but the initial pull was that um, for me. And um, I think with whole, I, I just think it was just too fascinating of a condition. Why would anybody want to be an amputee? But this one was much more to me about what does the condition do? The condition itself was fascinating, people but around. what does it do to the people around you? And I think that's kind of the kind of films I tend to make, is that it's not just the thing. I don't know how to explain it. It's not the thing. It's the things around the thing. Right. That's right. probably the best way to explain <laughs> that. <laughs> that's kind of how you photograph these, too. Uh, let's take a look yeah. at, the, at some stuff from Life Without Pain. Pain teaches, pain protects, pain can save you from a lot of bad things in life.
Komm, einmal schnell. Her um, lack of feeling pain um, is not as bad as we feel it for her. Det värsta är ju det med att det är ingen som kan förstå det för vi har upplevt det på närhåll. Vi har ingen som kan det till någon vad som egentligen sker. Well, I can see what you mean about you want to explore how these conditions affect the, the people around it too. Because yeah, yeah. these are such um, life-changing things. Well, and then of course we find, you know, after spending a year with you know, the, the family in Minnesota, and then I went to Norway and Germany, met these other families, and it was fascinating how the, the families were so similar. I mean, all three families had older siblings who were perfect. Mm -hmm. I mean, that just doesn't happen that often. I think that's the, truly the case maybe in families that have kids with any disability. There's always one sibling that, you know, kind of has to balance out the sibling who gets all the attention, and so they end up being perfect. It was fascinating. Yeah. And actually, people, you know, another thing just drives me. I think you asked me that before. Um, I'm, if I wasn't a filmmaker and I hadn't been a journalist, I probably would have been a psychologist. As early as like eighth grade, I remember people telling me, "Oh, you you should be a psychologist." And people would call me junior psychologist. They'd always ask me questions and for advice and things like that. And I think that that for me is what this is. It's a way of sort of understanding people and seeing what drives people and how relationships work. And that's really what I'm doing when I'm making my films. Well, what about the relationships that you have, I mean, with your subjects? I mean, as a, coming from news, I mean, I'm sure there's, there's the importance of maintaining the distance because you want to just have Oh, a, I don't have to do that anymore. You don't have to do that. No anymore. more distance. Yeah, no, I can just much. delve right into their lives. And yeah, I mean, these people were very, you know, always feel very connected to, to the people I'm filming. And I think the, one of the ways I create the intimacy and, and the sort of safe space for people to talk to me is that because I'm doing most of the work myself, and so it's just me and a camera about this big. And um, that camera has become, and a wireless microphone is, is key. Right. Because that gives, allows to have distance without having any soft uh, hardware between me and the person I'm interviewing. I mean, like us, we don't have a microphone. You're not going like this to yeah. me, you know, <laughs> which is awkward. But with a wireless mic, you can do that. So um, I, I have felt that that's been a really nice way for people to feel comfortable with me. That camera might be sitting on my lap sometimes. And right. a lot of the shots are from that angle, and that's why. It's just we're having a conversation, but the camera happens to be there. You can't do that with a crew, you know, with a big boom mic and a guy with a camera like we used to do in news, you know? Sure. So there is an intimacy that happens from that. And people tell me things I wouldn't tell people otherwise. Right. I mean, and when you get involved with these people, you know, in, in Whole and Life Without Pain especially, these are really personal stories. Yeah. Um, I mean, people in, well, in Whole were saying that the alternative to amputation was suicide. Yeah. I mean, these are really dark places they go to. Yeah. I mean, when you come out of that, how are, are you, how are you affected? How are you changed? Well, you know, some, it's, it's sometimes you, I know you, you won't believe this probably, but sometimes when I'm filming, I have, it's so, uh, I'm so focused on getting the shot or making sure the audio is clean, you know, that I don't experience it right then and there. And this is an ongoing thing. And sometimes not even while I'm editing it, sometimes I don't. But once I put it all together and I sit back and watch it, then I'm affected the same way a viewer is affected. Because I'm so, you know, because I'm in the field alone most of the time, I have to produce and direct and shoot. I mean, you're doing all this stuff alone that I can't always experience it. I'm paying attention to the clues about it. Right. And I know something important's happening and sometimes I'll change a shot based on that, like the framing. Like, I'll be on a wide shot and then someone's about to cry. I know I gotta get closer, you can't, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm thinking about that, I can't experience that moment with them. Hmm. But I shared that moment with them. Yes. And so it's like a bonding thing for life. I mean, when I'm in, you know, the, in surgery, basically I was in the operating room um, when Gabby had eye surgery, which I don't know if we're gonna discuss that or show that part of it, but. That's a very, I mean, the parents weren't even there and I was there. Yeah. So that's a lot to carry. So you share those experiences in a way that you, I mean, that's, it's like being at people's weddings. They always, 
you were there, <laughs> right. you know, and married as well. I was there with these people, yeah. you know, at that special moment in their You're lives. You're part of it forever. So, it forever. I get phone calls from the truckers. Uh, well, I did a couple years ago. Hey, I'm in town. You know, I want to uh, get together and uh, have coffee. Like, okay, great. Well, we got to go somewhere where I can park the truck. So just the kind of thing, you know, and they're calling me like on the road and get together. I mean, like, I'm very much a part of people's lives, and I like that. I, I like the idea that my camera gets me that entree into people's lives I wouldn't have otherwise. Do you stay in touch with these families? The oh, yeah. Oh, I'll, yeah, always, everybody. <laughs> you can't not. Yeah, I, was, I would think it'd be hard <laughs> It's to. part of what being a filmmaker is, and people have to know that going in uh, when they make films. I think some people think they want to make documentaries, but when they find out that you have to be so much a part of people's lives and, and, and really feel connected to them. People are afraid of that. Yeah. Um, I'm not. I like <laughs> it. <laughs> We're going to take another uh, look at um, a clip from A Life Without Pain. Okay. And when I come back, I want to talk more about kind of your process, like when you get into post, when you know you have it. Oh. and Because you're editing, you got to know when the picture is live. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. let's take a look at another clip from okay. A Life Without Pain. She knows she's different. I've told her many times that her body doesn't work the same way as her sister's. And that's just the way God made her. The nerves that carry the pain signal from anywhere on the surface of her body to her brain, it never gets to the brain. She feels no pain. When I first found out that she doesn't feel pain, I was like, wow, relief. Oh, wow. That's something easy that we can deal with. Then you start thinking about it. <laughs> I agree to kill that. You're doing a silly dance. All the time I think, will she get to go through school without a wheelchair? Yes, she can. She goes swimming. People always think of pain, pain, pain. Oh, if I could get rid of the pain. I'm thinking, you do not even know how lucky you are that you can feel it. Oh, how old is she? So you know days old. She was born today. Born today. Birth was pretty, pretty textbook. Easy, actually, uh -huh. compared to Katie. I, I remember as soon as she was born, you're asking me, is she okay? Is she okay? Yeah. She looked perfect. You know, I got to cut the cord and all that stuff. Say hi, Grandma. Hi, Grandpa. The first thing I remember, the first hint of being something being wrong, is that I could wake her up in the morning, and she'd be so cold in the crib. It just She'd be very cold, amazingly cold. But then, you know, she'd wake right up and be happy, and and I just remember that. And it's one of the things that's sticking out in my mind is the first thing that I noticed that was a little different. The other thing was when your babies and they do the blood test. The K. The P K. Test. Yeah, the P K U where they they do a heel prick. She slept through that, and whereas Katie, you know, somebody poking a needle in your heel. And the nurse was stunned too. She's like, wow, she's sleeping right through that. What a good baby. Mm -hmm. Well, she never felt it, but we didn't know that. She was really an easy, wonderful baby for about the first seven, eight weeks of her life. In about four months, she was an early teether, just like her sister. She started cutting teeth and she had bit down through her skin. She would have bit down to the bone had I let her. It was just chewed up. It looked mangled and nasty. It looked like raw hamburger on her hands. Um, the gnawing became ex severe. These three little fingers were just from, from below the nail to that first knuckle, just mush. Well, we decided to, to pull her teeth because she was mutilating her fingers and she, you know, she chewed on her tongue like it was bubble gum. And she ended up in the hospital dehydrated because her tongue was so swollen she couldn't, couldn't drink. I've showed them to her. I've kept them all. She'd scratch. She'd bump uh -oh. huh? and never really cry. Yeah. Hi, this is what they first started to check her body chemistry, just to figure out what was going on with her as baby. And everything came back um, negative or with the, you know, absolutely clear yellow, you know, everything came back within completely normal limits. At this point, the doctors had done a drastic procedure on her eyes called tarsorphy, which is literally sewing her eyelids shut to try to preserve the integrity of her cornea. She had done so much damage, sticking her own fingers and thumbs directly into her eyes. She regressed from, you know, like a 14, 15 month old child back to a six month old who just sat so in her own house, didn't have any interest in wanting to play with toys. She was just 
distraught. I mean, she was, uh, we couldn't explain to her what the heck was going on. It was horrible. It was like watching your child take, you know, 50 steps backwards. This is the part of her life where we're supposed to be showing her the world, and teaching her, showing her new things, and, and she's just trying, she's pulling into a shell. Uh, some of that stuff was so hard to watch. I mean, when they talk about what a good baby she was because they could prick her foot and she didn't react. It's like, yeah. when I mean, you kind of know what's happening, so you're like, you just, you have no idea what you're about to go through. I mean, at the time, they had no idea what they were in yeah, for. This film is so much harder to watch than Hole. Like, people are so afraid of Hole because it's about people who want to be an amputee, but yes. they don't, you know, they think that's scary. This is actually harder to watch because it's children. Yeah. And this thing is happening to them, yep. you know, and they're not choosing it, and it's... And it's, they can't eloquently express kind of what's happening, and it's, not, it's no. they're not in, in touch or in control. No, and there's actually what I like... Uh, it, it, there was an opportunity to do some foreshadowing there and sort of set up this story in a way almost with, with a classic uh, narrative film. Yeah. You know, there was all those elements to do that, which which made it um, interesting for me to put together. Well, let's talk about the post-process. I mean, sure. when you were got into editing, was it like, oh, that's it, all the footage is done, and edited no. it away, or did you I find edited out? as I went along. Okay. And um, when you edit as you go along, you realize what you're missing. It's It's a so that it allows for sort of making up for things that you are missing that you didn't get earlier. So um, I probably edited, I, I don't remember how long it was now, but probably a 10, 12 minute segment of some kind early on. And then I just kept adding, like there's a segment here where they go to the psychologist because mm -hmm. Gabby starts acting up. That was, you know, a segment in its own right. And, you know, I edited that like not too long after I did it. and. Um, it just kind of keeps going, and I don't think, I mean, you don't always know when you're done um, until you sometimes just know. I mean, you know because the pieces all come together right. I mean, there were so many different ways I tried to put this film together. Um, I tried to interweave the different um, age groups and the different kids, mm -hmm. and that didn't work. Uh. It was, it really, I had a, a whole cut that was going back and forth between each kid, but what I really ended up doing was just like, let's see what Gabby's life is like, and then you can see what a seven-year-old's life would be like, and then you can see what an 11-year-old. And it was a little unbalanced because I had so much more material from Gabby than I had from the other ones, but that was the challenge. I think once I knew, uh, really, it wasn't until I got back from Norway and Germany that I felt like I could finish. And Gabby's story kind of does does two things. It tells us her story and tells us about the condition yes, right. a, as a whole. So, yeah. I mean, it, it has a bigger part and it probably... Well, and there's a great example, too, because I interviewed doctors and I interviewed, you know, philosophers, kind of the way you would do it if you were in news, right. <laughs> my background, but um, I ended up not putting any of them in there because really the films I like to make, I want you to experience what it would be like to be them. Sure. That's all. No two sides, nothing. This is, you know, do I need doctors in here? Some people might say I do to explain more, but I don't really care. Yeah, <laughs> that's not what's interesting to me. Right, that's what the people yeah. around that subject are going through. Yeah. Well, I mean, you really went from this movie into you jumped in both feet into a huge adventure, something very different. I oh, just, literally. Well, actually, I was filming. The, oh, go ahead. Well, I was just gonna say I just got a chance to watch Urban Explorers Into the Dark. It, into no, the darkness. Into the darkness. Yep. Excuse me. That's okay. Um, and that's a totally different kind of oh, film. Yeah. Talk a little bit about that. Well, I think, um, well, first of all, I have been working on Urban Explorers Into the Darkness for three years. So I actually started filming Urban Explorers when I was on the festival circuit with Hole. Oh. So it started that long ago. And I, what I did was kind of put it down while I was making a life without pain. I mean, I still shot a little bit here and there. I'd still go out on missions. Urban Explorers is about people who go exploring places where most people would never normally yeah. go. You Catacombs, know, like, yeah. sewers. Drains, abandoned buildings, breweries. all kinds of stuff like yeah. that. And some people do it for the kind of the thrill of it and other people do it to document um, history. You know, yeah. th these buildings and places before they're about to be demolished. So the photography is amazing. But so I was like really excited about this film, but I had to do a life without pain. Like I, I just, I had to, I got really intense filming that. So I kind of put Urban Explorers down while I was doing the film, so I made a whole other film in between from when I started. And it's a completely different kind of film, another fascinating subculture. Sure. 
Um, I heard about it. Um, there were some people in St. Paul who were arrested one weekend. We were on high alert for terrorism here, and you know, they were wearing black and had night vision goggles and all kinds of crazy stuff. And they were held in jail. People thought, uh, the police thought that they were terrorists. And so I thought, oh, I wonder who these people are. They're urban explorers. What is that? And then I find out it's a big international subculture. Yeah. And um, so I was, you know, just literally, as you said, plunged full fit. <laughs> plunged <laughs> into that. Good. It was a lot of fun. It was very different subject matter, but also still the idea of sort of putting a face to a subculture that people don't know about. Yeah, really it was like interesting. That. I mean, there's a guy from Iowa, Slim Jim. Oh, yeah. He was, he was the Slim best. Slim Jim. <laughs> Would you like a Slim Jim pin? I heart Slim Jim yes. pin? Give me that. Because you know about Slim Jim. He's <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> he was an interesting guy. I mean, his yeah. story was interesting. And you followed him on his adventures in the Twin Cities, and then yeah. you took him all the way out to We Well, we went to, he took Scotland? me. We went to Scotland to the first Urban Explorers Convention. And you just didn't uh, send a camera Europe. in. What's that? You didn't just send a camera. Oh, no, I went. No, we went. <laughs> we did it all. We, I mean, I have everything in that film I did, which is hard to believe now. I yeah. So I think back on it, people are like, did you really go in the catacomb? Did you really climb down the... I did. With all those bones and... Yeah. I mean, I can't... I don't know. I don't know. I guess I've just been a little possessed lately. I don't know. <laughs> I guess my, my, my midlife version of Outward Bound. Right. You know, <laughs> Outward Bound, but for, you know, filmmakers and... You know, of a certain age. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, I saw at the end that you had legal representation. Uh, was that just to put your kind of your deal together for distributing the film and kind of, or, you know, just your legal? Or was that, did someone have like a kitty full of money so when you got arrested <laughs> in France or Glasgow or wherever you were that they would come get you out of jail? I mean, was, wasn't there a risk of you being incarcerated? Um, yes. <laughs> Fortunately, it never happened. Really? Yeah, well, we didn't, I didn't ever got caught. Uh -huh. I mean, there were some close calls, which are in the film, a couple of them. Yeah, the close calls are... There I were mean, other ones that are not in the film. That they, It was pitch black. I mean, literally pitch black. And we had to turn the camera off because any little anything... I mean, if I... It, it, there was one point... Oh, I, can't, I really can't talk about it because anybody's listening when they hear what we did. But, um, yeah, we did not get... I never got caught, no. <laughs> had, had a lot of running. Running. Let's, uh, let's take a look at the clip and jumping. from Urban Explorers Into the Darkness. I can barely even see you anymore. Jerry? What? There's a kid in the room. What? As well. When I go out to a random friend or random person I know from work who has no interest in exploring, they don't have that exploring bug, as you could say. They're like, well, what the hell? Why do you do that? That's just stupid. It's a certain visceral experience you can't really define. Going underground in tunnels, sewers, drains, on roofs of buildings. It's exploring your environment, anything urban, anything man-made. Uh, découvrir Paris pour découvrir uh, et puis uh, le côté historique de la chose. How's it going, man? What's your complaint exactly? What's your complaint exactly? You're dress passing. Exploring while it's portrayed possibly in, in certain branches in the media and on certain websites as an elite super ninja thing to be doing actually is, for us anyway, about having fun. Anyone inside the castle, get the fuck out. <laughs> And that is just a teaser of kind of some of the adventures and stuff that you had with yeah. those guys. How, how long was the schedule for this? How long were you shooting? Well, it was three years, uh, and uh, I didn't, I had, <laughs> I don't know if I should, I had a whole other version of this film like a year and a half ago. That was, uh, it was much more probably MTV style, you know, people talking and fast edits and all that kind of stuff. And um, I showed it to a small group of people and um, a lot of people really liked it, but it made me hate it. I hated it. And so we kind of started from scratch. I haven't had an editor on this 
uh, from the beginning, which has been a gift. Um, Charlie Gershewski from Channel Z Films. And working with him, this film is so much more polished and um, more professional looking than anything I've done before. But we kind of reformatted it and kind of decided to make it more f filmy. Mm -hmm. uh, let, it breathe. let it breathe and experience it with the people who are exploring as they're exploring. And, and uh, so basically a year and a half later, here we are. Yeah. So where are you right now with the film? Festivals, distribution? Yep, we're on the festival circuit. Um, we're, we've got, I've got an agent, uh, a rep that is uh, doing all kinds of reppy things. And uh, that they we'll, do. we'll see, yeah, what they do. As they want, as they want And to we'll do. see what happens. I mean, it's winning some awards and we're, um, we've got a lot of interest and um, uh, pretty sure that we'll end up on broadcast. I'm not worried about that. All my films have ended up being broadcast. I think on this one, our goal was to get a theatrical, at mm. least a small theatrical. It feels like that when you're in a theater, you could sit and watch this. You could, it's marketable. It's uh, people seem to really like it, and I hope that that happens. If it doesn't, and I'll live. People love Slim Jim. How can you not? Oh yeah, I mean, <laughs> the man, the man packs his a yogurt in the sandwich bag. You got to love him. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Pete, uh, you won an award on the East Coast. What was that? Was something uh, kind of unique. Oh my God! Well, the Boston Underground Film Festival. Boston we won Best Narrative or Best. Feature, I think it was best feature, and uh, you know I go to get my award, and it's kind of like this thing. It looks like an Emmy, but it's actually uh, a vibrating bunny. Oh. And yeah, they handed it to me, and it was vibrating, and it was <laughs> quite quite interesting. But um, yeah, and we went up in Fargo, and you know nothing huge, but it's been uh, a nice thing for such a few amount of festivals so far right. to well have receives. a good good reaction like that's been great. Yeah, and um, people want to keep up with it. Can I see where it's going? Where do we go? Um, go to my, the website for that is urbanexplorersfilm.com. Okay. Um, there's also a MySpace. You can be our MySpace friend, which oh, is good. We have myspace.com slash urbanexplorers. And uh, you can sign up, I think, on the Urban Explorers Film site to get like an email uh, notice from us about things that are going on, like when we have DVDs available or screenings and that kind of thing. So for sure, sign up if you're interested. And you can also go to Frozen Feet Films, which is my... Uh, production company and kind of that will link you to all my films. So, a Life Without all. Pain and Hole and all the other ones. So well, that's just amazing. I I love this movie. I like all your movies, but I really like this one. I love oh, the sense of adventure. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah, it's a lot. Show. It was a lot of fun. It was very uh, intriguing. The the more I found out about it, I loved the photography uh, in the film, which is something unexpected. You know, when I first started out, I didn't realize that was going to be so. Amazing. And yeah, it's the a big photography part of the film. that was done as part of this was beautiful. Yeah. You're going to do a book? Hope so. Any publishers who are listening? <laughs> Actually, I've had a couple of requests for that too. Like things are just churning. It's very exciting. A That's lot of good things are happening. So, so we'll just keep up with you through the website and see how you're doing and yeah, see where check you're it at. With me. And I and uh, I'll give you another pin. Well, we usually these normally cost a dollar, but you know, free today for you. UrbanExplorersFilm.com. And I heard Slim Jim were very popular at the festivals <laughs> so far. Well, we will check you out on the web for sure. Support independent filmmaking in the Twin Cities. Keep rocking and rolling. All right, guys, thanks for watching Butter City today. You can keep up with us on the web at buttercity.com. Send us questions, comments, or ideas for a future show. We'll see you later. Thanks. Support for Butter City is provided by